Hi everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for a virtual tour and discussion with Hippies Farm on market gardening efficiency and season extension. I'm Nikki Kolb, Nofa New Hampshire's operations manager. And Nofa New Hampshire is the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Hampshire. We promote organic farming, gardening, and land care practices for healthy communities. And this is our second of six tours in our 2020 craft program. CRAFT stands for Collaborative Regional Alliances for Farmer Training. The program focuses on peer-to-peer -peer farmer led education and is supported by Farm Credit Northeast Ag Enhancement. And now I'd like to introduce Dan Bernsteel, Director of Agricultural Operations at Hippies Farm. Hi Dan, welcome. Hello. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. So, so thanks again everyone. And now let's take a look around Hippie's Farm. Hi, I'm Dan Bernsteel. I'm the farm director here and welcome to Hippie's Farm. Uh, we are a five and a half acre micro farm located in Perry Urban, Hooks at New Hampshire. We are certified organic. We've been that way for about a year now. Uh, and we've been NOFA members since our inception about three years ago at the end of 2017. Our main markets in the area are direct to restaurants, direct to consumers. We sell to a local farm stand and we also supply a 56 share CSA. We wanted to have you guys on the farm today virtually to talk about season extension, efficiency and market gardening. Some people may be wondering what the heck is a market garden? So we kind of derive a lot of our techniques from the French Parisian market gardens. It was a series of small gardens set up in or around the city of Paris that fed the entire city. Uh, as it sounds, and on a setting like ours where we don't have a ton of land, that means we have to be hyper efficient. Uh, we don't have tens or dozens or hundreds of acres that we can sprawl out on and just focus on raw numbers. That means we've got to do everything really, really tight on this farm. It also means that we focus a lot on high value crops. Because we don't have as much space to spread out on, we've got to make sure that the crops we focus on bring in a high dollar value and have a high demand. Uh, because of that, our number one crop, our flagship crop, is our Salanova lettuce mix. Uh, we sell hundreds of pounds of this lettuce mix every week, uh, bagged up and in, into CSAs, out to the farm stand, restaurants take in hundreds of pounds of it. Uh, it it's a phenomenal crop. Uh, it takes a little while, but we use a few techniques to make sure that we're doing it as efficiently as possible. So when we first started, we grew a baby lettuce leaf. It took about 28 days to come to maturity and we direct seeded it. But we made the switch to the Salanova at the beginning of last year because we grew it as a trial in one of our greenhouses over the winter. We brought it over to a restaurant customer and uh, the next week we switched back to our baby leaf mix and they said, do you have any of that other lettuce? Can you get us some of that stuff? Uh, they said just the texture, the flavor was better. It grows a more full bodied flavor and really can develop that flavor profile. Uh, and they also said what was interesting was it kept in the cooler better and it filled up a plate better. So they could use less lettuce mix to fill a plate and they actually had customers that were uh, requesting it. So we, we made the switch and we've never looked back. Uh, the Salanova will take about two weeks to grow in cell plugs. We start them in 288s, which is a small cell plug to get started. Most growers recommend 128, and we may make the switch to that at some point, uh, but the 288s have been working for us. So two beds will take us about four 288s. Uh, we grow them very close together. Again, limited space means that we don't have a lot of space to sprawl out on. And because the lettuce is only in the ground for about depending on the time of year, 35 to 60 days, it doesn't really have a lot of time to develop problems that you would see from crops when they're really close together, disease pressures. Um, and then we also, because we rotate crops through in the middle of a season, we don't see a lot of problems with uh, soil root rots building up or pests that would stay in one location. So we inherently have crop rotation as part of our system. Um, so we have these on six inch centers and as you can see, we've got this extra heavy black uh, landscape fabric. 
that we lay out. We made a template that we traced out our holes, drilled them out with a three inch uh, saw blade. And now whenever we lay out a fresh piece of fabric, we can lay out our template and we take a little uh, hand torch and we go through and we burn all the holes out. After that, we'll transplant our lettuces right in here and that's gonna keep most of the weeds at bay for the time that this is in the ground. Um, that makes it a really, a really efficient way to grow this lettuce. We sometimes will have to do a little bit of hand weeding, but we can do that as we go through and harvest. Um, and again, a 100 foot bed is probably going to yield us about 50 pounds on the first harvest. About two weeks later, we'll get a second harvest and we'll get another 25 to 50 pounds. And that's, that's kind of being light. We have gotten harvest before that are 100 pounds on a 100 foot bed. So uh, we'll get in the spring and fall in the shoulder seasons, we'll get up to five harvests on one crop. Uh, this time of year in the midsummer, we get two to three before it starts to go to seed. So uh, it, again, it's a great crop. Uh, the, the real sell for this crop for me was that with our baby leaf lettuce, when it was ready to harvest, it was ready to harvest and you had to get it. And if you didn't, those leaves got really stretched out. The quality went downhill. With the Salanova, if you're not ready to get it the week it's ready, it just grows more leaves. So instead of getting these stringy, uh, non-flavorful leaves, you just get more of these really high, high quality leaves. So we really like it. Um, again, it's a little bit more labor on the front end to get these in the ground, but the product that we get on the back end makes it, makes it worth it for us. Um, so the black landscape fabric is one of the things that we do to, to increase our efficiency and to manage weeds. One of the other things that we do is we use these, uh, these black silage tarps. And this is something that a lot of market gardeners do. Uh, we certainly did not innovate this. We've learned from a lot of really smart growers. Um, what we do is we do a stale seed bedding technique. So when we're ready to plant, especially like our arugula or tatsoi or one of our, our baby leaf uh, greens, we wanna make sure that they have a chance to get a head start as best they can. So we're gonna come through and we're gonna prep our bed. You know, we're gonna, if we need to, we'll broad fork it. Uh, we'll add any amendments. We utilize chicken manure, uh, or I'm sorry, feather meal, which is a byproduct, uh, an organic byproduct uh, that adds nitrogen into the soil and some potash, which is also organic. Uh, we have really high phosphorus in our soils. We do a soil test twice a year, so we don't have to add any phosphorus. So as we've continued on, one of the things that we wanted to to get out of our operation as much as possible was tillage. Uh, I don't remember who I heard this quote from, but one of the great quotes that I heard was that the great sin that all organic agriculture is trying to make up for is tillage. So we're trying to move around that as much as we can. It's, I mean, I know why we do it. It is a great way to get your beds ready. It, it makes a nice seed bed, it gets rid of weeds. So in getting rid of tillage, that means that we have to try to find other ways that we can get those same benefits. So uh, in this field this year, we're just starting our minimal tillage system. It's been working out really well. Uh, so we did one last big major tillage event with a rototiller this year, tilled everything up, and then we formed all of these beds by hand, uh, which was not fun. Uh, it was labor intensive. You can ask our crew here, they didn't like doing it, but now that they're set, they're set. Uh, so when we turn a bed over now, we'll remove the old crop residue, and then to get our seed bed ready, uh, what we'll do is we'll spread our, our amendments, uh, we'll remove the old crop residue, and then we'll use this tool. We just got this tool a little while ago. Uh, this is called the tilther. And so the tilther is interesting because it looks like a little rototiller, which it basically is, but the tines don't go any deeper than about an inch. And so a lot of that microbial activity that we're really looking to preserve in our soils is down below that top level where we're mostly using like compost, or something else, uh, our, our old crop residues. We just wanna break that down and make a nice smooth seed bed. But we're, again, we're not disturbing any of that activity. We're not opening that up to oxygen, which is gonna kill off a lot of that mac uh, microbial activity. Um, the, my favorite part about this tool is that it's so portable. It's light, it's portable, it's easy to use when it doesn't get stuck on landscape fabric. Uh, and it's battery operated. So we plug these batteries in at the end of the day uh, and the next day it's ready to go. So it's a pretty simple tool. It's just a little rope that's attached to the, uh, the button of your drill. 
and you pull a little handle here. And so it's gonna spin those tines and that's gonna make your seed bed that you can plant into. So we'll go through, we will create that nice seed bed and then that leads us to our stale seed bedding technique. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna give some of our smaller crops and some of those harder crops like carrots a, a chance to get a head start over these weeds. So we use stale seed bedding. So we'll get everything ready like we're just ready to plant it. The next step is gonna be seeding. Uh, and then we'll water the beds in and we cover them with these black silage tarps. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna encourage the weeds to come up, hit the tarp, and then the heat of the sun is gonna kill those off. Depending on how warm it is on a day like today, if we get a week of days like today where it's 90 degrees plus, we can see this work its magic in as quick as a week and a half. Uh, otherwise it may take uh, about two weeks plus. Um, so this bed has probably been covered for a little under a week now. And you can see it's already looking pretty good. Uh, pretty clear weeds, um, no real little ones coming up. We got a few stragglers here, but if we leave this over the weekend, it'll clear most of this stuff up. Uh, we also will sometimes, if we uncover the bed, we really got to get this back into production. We don't have another two weeks to wait for it. We'll tarp it, we'll wait for about a week. And then when we uncover, we'll see if those weeds those little baby weed seeds on the top have hit the white thread stage and that's just when they emerge. They look like little white threads. Uh, and we'll kill them off then using, um, using a flame weeder. And the benefit of the flame weeder is it's just a torch that we pass over the top of the soil. Uh, that doesn't affect any of the microbial activity because it's just passing over. So it's superheating one area really briefly that's right at the top and it's just gonna singe those weeds. Uh, what that's also doing is it's not stirring up the soil and allowing new weed seeds below the, the top of your uh, seed bank to stir up to the surface and then germinate and become a problem for us later. So when we do that, if we plant a small salad crop in here, uh, like an arugula, that takes a few, you know, probably about a week until it really starts to get going. So we can see the arugula grow in get a nice stand and then totally outcompete these weeds. Um, so uh, the other thing that the black fabric will do is if we leave it on longer, we wet it down, we leave it on longer, it's gonna encourage the earthworms that are in the soil to come up to the surface. They really like that uh, damp, dark environment and warm environment. It makes them think it's nighttime. So they'll come up and they'll start feasting on all that plant matter that's right up at the top there. Uh, one of the, the game changer tools that we purchased last year uh, is our quick cut harvester. Um, so this tool we got from a company called Farmer's Friend, um, another battery operated tool, really handy. Uh, and this turned harvesting a bed of baby salad greens from something that would take two of our workers about an hour to do with a, a knife in the field now one of our workers can get a bed done in 10 minutes. So again, battery operated, the chalk just grabs onto a little post right here. And as it spins, it's gonna operate this oscillating blade as well as these flails. So it's going to cut your crop and throw it back into the basket. So we've got our nice stand of arugula right here. This has been harvested a few times, so it's on the way out. Um, and so we come through and we can just use this tool to easy as that. So we'll have someone come out with a harvest bin, work right down the line, and we can get this done in 10 minutes, harvest hundreds of pounds of arugula, just like that. So now that we've got our arugula out of the field, the next stop is over to the wash pack, get this washed up, packaged up, and put in the walk-in cooler. So we're going to head on over there now. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, on a, any given week, we're sending out hundreds of pounds of salad greens. Uh, whether it's to direct customers or to restaurants, most of our customers want their salad greens pre-washed. Uh, on our first year, we operated totally out of a three-base sink. 
uh, and we spent most of our week in that washroom sending through greens and hand washing greens in a three-bay sink. Um, drying them in a hand crank salad spinner, it was not working for us. So uh, we upgraded, we built this new wash pack facility and it's totally changed the way we're able to operate. We can send those 100 pounds of greens in through here through a day. Um, so the first step is we'll bring it in. We've got this big wash tub. Um, this is our greens washer now. So this is a jacuzzi pump hooked up just to a series of tu tubes, uh, PVC pipe that's got holes drilled in it. So we fill this up with water. We dunk our greens in here and then we turn on the pump. And as you can see, that's a nice little jacuzzi for our greens. We'll let that run for about two to five minutes. Uh, and while we're, we're letting that wash, we can work on other things. Again, typically we have a few uh, hundred pounds of greens coming through. So the first one will start, we'll prep the next batch. And then as we're pulling out that first batch, we're getting that second batch ready, moving down the line. Um, after this water starts to get a little bit murky, we drain it. We have a 1500 gallon holding tank in the ground right here. And then we can pump that water back out, uh, use it to irrigate some of our non-edible uh, crops. Not sure the integrity of that water, but it's great for trees. So after we send it through the bubbler, we'll put the product into these food safe plastic bins. These are sanitized and washed every time. And from there they go into this modified washing machine. So this is a hack developed or at least brought to us by our friend Michael Kilpatrick. Um, and it's just an old Maytag washing machine that's been turned into a new salad spinner. Um, everything has been removed from this except for the pump and a timer. So we'll fill these bins up halfway, turn on our timer and spin this for about two minutes. After that, any of the greens are removed from there, put onto this drying screen. From there, we package it up either into 10 ounce bags, two pound totes, or 10 pound totes to then go out to our customers. So we've washed all of our greens. Let's go take a look at some of our high tunnels where we've got our fruiting crops. We'll talk a little bit about season extension. So we're here in one of our high tunnels. Uh, this is tunnel three. We have four main high tunnels and then we are just installing a new uh, caterpillar tunnel as we speak. Um, and we have a few different techniques for season extension that you can see in here. Um, some of the easier, more affordable and mobile forms of season extension we use are low tunnels. Uh, we've got just some small hoops that we can set up bring out either some row cover or some greenhouse plastic and throw that up in any field we need to. If we see that we've got an early frost or a late frost coming um, and we're trying to just either get our crops started early or just get a few more days out of it, uh, we can throw those low tunnels up. They're a really good way to extend our season. Uh, anything that we want to be growing throughout the winter comes down to the high tunnels. Uh, these have quickly become a must for us. We did our first season without high tunnels. I couldn't imagine going back to growing without them in New England. So you can kind of see a few of the things that are going on in this tunnel right now. The first one is that we use a really aggressive form of pruning on our tomatoes in here. Uh, and that goes back to efficiency as well. We want to make sure that when our workers are coming through and harvesting, there is no working and trying to find which tomatoes are ripe. You can see it all right here. It's all ready to go. Uh, this also, because we are a zero spray farm, we use no pesticides, organic or uh, conventional. So we try to think around our diseases and try to make sure that we're making life uncomfortable for them so they can't get established. So by opening up all this area, we get good airflow coming through. So our nasty uh, leaf funguses like your early blights, slate blights, septoria can't get established. Um, it, that airflow is going to keep water from standing as well as being covered from the rain uh, and 
our first year we grew out in the fields, all of our tomatoes on more space. Uh, our second year we brought everything into the tunnel, started trellising and pruning really heavily, and it was a total game changer. I think we grew twice as much on less space. Um, so as the season goes on, you can see these tomatoes are pretty tall. Uh, once they get up to the ceiling, we utilize these uh, tools called tomahooks. Uh, and this just has a little bit more twine on there. So as the tomatoes grow, we can let out some twine and lean these guys a little bit further down the row and lower them down. So we're harvesting the fruits up the stalk. When we get, you know, harvested up to here, we're gonna have one guy come through, one guy or gal come through, let out some twine, lower this down. So instead of all of our workers having to come through two or three times every week, get on step ladders to get up there and get the crop, you get one person who comes through every other week, let everything down, it makes life easier for everybody else. So you can also see down at the soil here, uh, some of our intercrop still coming through. So we had a baby leaf lettuce mix in here um, as just a bridge crop. This tunnel was mostly our Salanova lettuces in the, uh, in the winter and spring. And then when we put our tomatoes in, we interplanted them right into that, uh, the lettuces. When the lettuces were done, we took out as much of that plant material as we could and we covered up with black plastic. We are moving away from the black plastic. Uh, it's, it's not a great thing to use year after year and have to throw it away. So what we're going to do is probably move to a silage tarp. It's reusable, works better anyway, and we can use it for other things. So probably the biggest thing that the eye is drawn to is this big black duct that comes out of the soil here. Uh, this is part of our climate battery system. And the climate battery system is an active thermal heating and cooling system. So the idea is on warm days, uh, like today, but especially in your shoulder seasons, uh, we have fans on the inlet uh, of that duct up in the top of the tunnel, as well as on the exhaust on the other side of the tunnel. And when it's warm, it's going to turn those fans on, draw the air in, and it feeds it down about four feet down into the ground into a series of ducting uh, that runs along the floor of the tunnel and that heats up that thermal mass. So when it comes out the other end, it's now been cooled by the cooler thermal mass. On cold nights, we can also turn the, those fans back on and it's gonna draw that heat back up out of there. It's not gonna keep it 70 or 80 degrees, but it will keep it above freezing. And so what that does is it allows us to not have to use row covers uh, or additional layers of uh, fabric in these tunnels. This is our first season with the climate battery. Uh, we just got it finished in October of last year, so we didn't really have time to charge the thermal mass. But what we did see is that on especially warm days, it takes the maximum temperature down a little bit, and on cold nights, it takes some of the edge off of it. So it just levels out all that temperature. We were approved this year for a $15,000 uh, sustainable agriculture research and education grant. Uh, so we will be studying this system uh, over the next two years and we'll have that data in a little while that we can give hard information as to how effective this is. Anecdotally, we've spoken to growers in Pennsylvania and Nova Scotia and they've reported great things with systems like this. So we're really excited about it. Uh, our backup heating system in this tunnel is we also have a radiant heating system. So we take uh, recycled cooking oil from the restaurant, uh, our restaurant customers, bring it onto the farm and use it to power a uh, spent cooking oil heating uh, boiler. And then we send that hot water in the soil to heat the soil temperature. And that's gonna allow us to uh, activate that microbial activity and then ideally radiate that heat upward making this an ideal location to grow uh, year round. All right, well, that's it. Thank you guys for coming and taking a virtual tour of the farm, seeing how we grow. Uh, it means a lot. And check us out on social media, at Hippies Farm on both Facebook and Instagram. You can find our, our produce at Johnson's Golden Harvest, which is a local farm stand, and at our sister restaurant, New England's Tap House Grill. Uh, when we don't have 
such tight restrictions going on, we are also an agritourism component. So you can book the farmhouse on the property on Airbnb. You can rent the property for your weddings. Uh, and we also try to have farm to table dinners here where we'll take our product, send it over to our sister restaurant. They'll design a five course tasting menu, bring it back here and you can have that meal here at the farm. So come check us out. Uh, we're really happy you could learn how we do things here. Have a great season. everyone that was fun um, so I'm going to open up our chat here and for anyone that joined after I said hello earlier I'm Nikki Kolb and I'm North New Hampshire's operations manager and Dan Burns deal is here as well and he's going to be talking to us and answering your questions so I'm going to open up the chat box oops that's too big Hey, Mickey, I, I did just want to add one thing that I don't think I got to uh, discuss too much in the video uh, Regarding the climate battery system, uh, I just wanted to go a little bit deeper into how that works. Uh, so the key mechanism that's at play with the climate battery is actually the phase change of water uh, between water vapor and uh, actual liquid water. So on a hot day, when it's drawing that uh, hot air and humidity down into the soil, it's rapidly cooled down to the point where uh, your relative humidity is a lot higher in warmer temperatures, so it can fit more moisture in the air. As it gets down below the ground, the air condenses and it can't fit as much water, so that water turns to liquid and drips into the thermal mass, which for us is gravel or crushed stone. That's what's actually getting your cooling in the soil. So then when it comes back out the other end on a cold night, that same phase changes at play where it's warmer in the soil, it comes up, uh, it hits the cold mass, so the air condenses, which turns your moisture into uh, water vapor right there, which that's actually your phase change at play. So um, at least theoretically, that's what we've been told. So we're excited to see how that works out. We have found or heard from our partners that that can lead to excess humidity in the wintertime, which anyone who's grown in the wintertime in high tunnel knows you may need to vent. So uh, we're going to be looking extensively at that this year. Uh, we do have part of the SARE grant as well have sensors that will measure both temperature and relative humidity in the tunnel so we can make sure we're not jacked up at 100% humidity all the time. Cool. Thank you for explaining that. And I also saw your note um, in the chat box too about the washing machine, which I thought that was really cool. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to start out with the questions and then as more people have questions along the way, please type them into the chat box. But um, so my first question for Dan is going to be um, if you can please just give us a, an overview of your farming background. Sure. Yeah. Um... So I got my start in farming, uh, just kind of tinkering around. Um, I actually got my background in hydroponics, which uh, we do not practice hydroponics on the farm, but uh, when I first got started, uh, I came from a background of uh, working on F-18s in the military. Um, and so I wanted to kind of marry that mechanical engineering background with uh, working with plants, because I really enjoyed working with plants. So I got started uh, just growing vegetables in, in my mother's basement uh, after I got out of the military. Uh, there's a funny story now of my fiance coming down into the basement when we first started dating and she sees all the things. She's like, oh God, what's growing down here? <laughs> Come to find out it's you know, eggplant and peppers and kale. Uh, so uh, in trying to find out what I wanted to do, I, I kind of, uh, I was still searching and she saw the way I would look at plants. She said, you should do something with that. And so uh, my initial thought was you can't make any money growing plants. Uh, and I went to uh, UNH for sustainable agriculture and food systems and quickly found out that that's not, not the case at all. Um, you can absolutely make a living in farming if you're doing it correctly, if you're paying attention to efficiency, if you're running it like a business. 
Uh, I did some independent research at UNH, still in hydroponics, uh, measuring the efficacy of height control strategies uh, using physical stress. Uh, so brushing basil plants and other uh, vegetative uh, crops and herbs and seeing if that would keep plant height down. Um, during my senior year, that was a really interesting project. And uh, during that time, I got put in touch with Dan McGill, the owner of New England's Half House. He was ready to start a farm. And we got together, talked for about an hour. And at the end of that discussion, he said, I want to hire you as my director of agriculture. Uh, so I started with Dan in 2017, just as the farm was getting started. Spent that winter planning everything out and hit the ground running. Uh, took over full time that spring in 2018. And we're now on our third growing season. Awesome, thank you. And I'm gonna ask one more question, then I'm gonna go into some questions that I see there in the chat box. Um, so I know that we um, in the video, we talked about like a few specific crops, but I thought maybe you could share with everyone some other crops that you're currently growing, or other crops that you grow throughout the year beyond the yeah. one So uh, the big one that we discussed in the video was Salanova. That's about 35% of our market right there. Uh, but our other biggest crops are the tomatoes, which were shown. We grow mostly uh, slicing varieties, Roma varieties, and cherry tomatoes. We may get into a little bit more heirloom varieties next year again. We did some in the past, but our market wasn't quite ready for them. So as we continue in the future, we'd like to include more of them. Um, greenhouse cucumbers and field cucumbers. Uh, the greenhouse do a little bit better because we do a lot of work with the restaurants. We also focus heavily, again, on a lot of leafy greens. Spinach is one of our biggest crops, especially in the winter, just because it's so hardy. Kale, Swiss chard, arugula. Uh, we've done a little bit of work with a braising mix, and then we started farting out that braising mix as different components. So baby kale, uh, mizuna, tatsoi, red mustard, arugula. Um, we also do radishes, carrots, beets, mostly golden beets. We do a little bit of chiogias. Uh, we don't do any reds because again, the, cust the restaurants we work with don't like that they stay in the plate. Uh, we do a little bit of microgreens, uh, mostly pea tendrils and a radish shoot. A lot of the other ones we found are just too finicky. A lot of different herb crops, basil, rosemary, cilantro, parsley, chives, um, oregano, uh, I think that's about it for herbs. We want to get a few more mint um, and pineapple mint and lemon verbena. Uh, we do a little bit with strawberries, but not enough to really uh, more more for us than anything. And eggplant, peppers, husk cherries are a really fun one. We we do a lot. Uh, garlic, yes, Bernadette just said garlic. Uh, Bernadette Olson is one of the teachers at Colony Middle School, and every year we try to do an outreach with the local middle school where they come to the farm, help us plant the garlic in the fall, and then we'll harvest it and donate some back to the school in the spring. So that's a really great collaborative effort that we always enjoy. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so we have a question here. Someone asked, can you please discuss your pest control procedures? Sure, yeah. Uh, we've had a little bit with animal pests, but not all that much, mostly like wood chunks. We are pretty urban, so a lot of the larger animals we don't have a lot of problems with. Deer are pretty much scared away from our area. Uh, so obviously our biggest pest pressures are, uh, excuse me, insect pests. And so it really depends on the crop and situation. And so the easiest way to control them is inside the high tunnels. We found our biggest pest in the high tunnels is aphids. Aphids are actually, I don't mind seeing an aphid outbreak starting as long as we scout it and we catch it ahead of time because aphids are fairly easy to control in the high tunnels. Uh, we use mostly inundated releases. So we'll order in uh, predators and parasites of aphids from uh, biopesticide labs. And the two that we mainly use are green lacewings, which are an insect that uh, predates aphids and Aphidius ervi and Aphidius colomani, which are both parasitic wasps that lay their eggs inside the aphids. 
the eggs will hatch, uh, killing the aphids, and then they will create new wasps inside the tunnel. Um, Pete is also in the chat. Pete is the farm manager at the Farm to UNH High Tunnel Program, and uh, Pete knows in detail that these uh, wasps are great unless you have aphids on your lettuce crop, in which case it is a huge pain to get all of those mums off your lettuce crop afterwards. Um, some of the other real pain uh, pests that we have are like squash bugs and striped cucumber beetles. Uh, for those, we're still kind of working on a great management system. The best one that I've seen comes from uh, Jean-Martin Fortier, uh, and he just basically uses insect netting on any of his high tunnels that have those crops in them. For crops in the field, if you've got your field cucumbers or summer squashes, what we'll do is we'll get them planted out, and as soon as they get out in the field, we'll cover those with insect netting. So we've got little uh, wire hoops that we'll set up and cover those with insect netting. As soon as the blossoms come out, we'll remove the insect netting so that the honeybees can get in and pollinators. Uh, that just gives them a head start. You're still going to see that damage come in, but at least you can give your crop a head start. And then the other big one is flea beetles. And same thing with flea beetles for any of our brassicas. Those, uh, not so much the adult kales, they actually don't do too bad on the adult kale, but the arugula, radishes, if we really want to preserve those tops for market tot soy, uh, that braising mix. As soon as we seed out those, uh, those crops, we cover them with the insect netting until they're ready for harvest because the flea beetles will just knock through them like crazy. So if you want that high quality arugula crop to bring to market that looks really nice, you have to cover them from start to finish. Thank you. So we have another question here. What do you find is the most difficult summer crop and fall crops? Well, the, I think a kind of a cop-out answer for the most difficult summer crop is spinach uh, because we don't grow it. We stop growing spinach uh, in the summer. I think some people can do it, especially if you use like a shade netting, but we just tell our customers, hey, we're not gonna have spinach from about late June, July, August, and then we'll try to get it back in September. Um, but probably the most challenging crop to grow in the summer is cucumber, just again, because of those striped cucumber beetles and the squash bugs. Um, probably the most labor intensive crop to grow during that time is tomatoes, but we find it's definitely worth it again, because we do so much with the pruning. Um, as far as in the winter, we've actually over time, again, we have almost, a, I think just shy of a quarter acre of indoor space. And every year we grow fewer and fewer crops uh, just because so many crops don't handle it well. So I think this year we have two 30 foot wide by 96 foot long high tunnels. One of them is going to be entirely lettuce and that's mostly just to get an early spring crop. Uh, we planted in September and October last year of South, all Salanova lettuce. We didn't harvest until the spring, but then once it started coming in, we were just getting crazy harvests for about a month. A month and a half, so it was worth it. Um, we're going to plant another one of those big tunnels, just spinach, because spinach is such a great crop during the winter. It's sweet, um, really tasty, and if you're harvesting it by hand, you just get so many grow, uh, so much grow back that it's completely worth it. Then we also have two 30 foot wide by 52 foot long tunnels, so they're about half as big. Uh, one of those is going to be half kale and half Swiss chard. Uh, and then the other one is going to be Claytonia is a really great winter crop. Uh, if you have never grown it, I would highly recommend it. Grows these beautiful little white flowers on the inside of heart-shaped leaves and they're very fresh uh, tasting, just a great crop. And they love the cold, but you can't grow them during the summer. Uh, and we'll also grow a little bit of uh, uh, cilantro in there as well. And then we just got one of the things you saw in the video was like a half finished mini tunnel. It's about 16 feet wide by uh, 48 feet long. That is from Rimmel uh, Greenhouses. They're just developing that. It's called the Bobcat. Uh, and that's gonna be all carrots this year. We've tried growing carrots in low tunnels with moderate success. Mostly they just come back in the spring. And so we really wanna try to dedicate some tunnel space to them this year. So that hopefully by December, January, we can be pulling some carrots out of the ground. Cause I think that'd be really great.
Thank you. Okay, so this question is sort of for both of us. Um, so someone has asked uh, black fabric versus plastic and what's recommended for gardens. So I would just say, you know, from Milford, New Hampshire's perspective, our philosophy is to always try to reduce the use of plastic, um, but I'd like to hear from you as a grower, you know, what uh, is in terms of answering the question, what's recommended for gardens? Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, obviously the thing with the black plastic is it's cheap. I mean, it's single use, which kind of stinks, um, but it is cheap. So when we were first getting started, we were on a shoestring budget. Uh, we had a bed former for our tractor, and so we till everything in, put the bed former on, and it would form all of our beds for us. And the nice thing about that was it also, you could put the bed, uh, the black plastic on there, and it would lay the plastic down really tight. It made a really great uh, seabed to, to plant your seeds into. But as you said, you know, single use plastic is not really great. Um, so again, we are moving away from that entirely. The landscape fabric, I think, is worth its weight in gold, especially if you invest and you get a really heavy duty landscape fabric that you can use year after year. If you cheap out and you get some of that cheapo stuff from Home Depot, you're going to lose it after your first year. But if you get the really heavy stuff, you can use that year after year after year. I've heard some growers that can get 15 years of use out of it. So I always, if you get the good stuff and you take care of it, I think that's really the way to go. You're not going to waste as much plastic. And you're probably going to save money in the long run. Thank you. Do you have any like brand that you specifically recommend? Um, I don't know the brand. We get a lot of our equipment through Brookdale Fruit Farm in Hollis. A lot of their pricing is super competitive. Uh, so I haven't been able to find anyone whenever we're looking for anything and they stock it. Usually Brookdale will beat their price by a lot. It's, pretty high quality stuff. Um, and, and on that same kind of thought process, the one thing that we are moving away from as well is kind of uh, goes against conventional thought, but drip tape. Um, we still use drip tape on some crops, but um, drip tape is also single use plastic. Uh, it can use less water in certain applications, but especially for our, our salad green, you need like four lines of drip tape per bed to get a good coverage of the bed to get good germination. And in that case, if you're using four lines of drip tape, even the really low flow stuff, that stuff is about uh, 0.34 gallons for 100 feet of drip tape. So using four of those, you're up to about, uh, what is that, 1.3 gallons per minute on a bed and then you have to multiply that by four what we found is that when we're using really low flow sprinkler heads we're actually using less water to cover those same four beds we're getting better coverage uh, and we can also use that same overhead irrigation on really hot days we can kick it on for like 10 15 minutes just to cover the top of the lettuce that's going to evaporate and cool our lettuces down and so it allows us to grow lettuce during the summer when it's usually really hard to grow lettuce. Nikki, can I ask a question, follow-up question? Sure. So I'm curious about the fabric. Is that um, something that um, NOFA can consider um, selling um, or trying to uh, put in their annual, um, I guess, their, their sales? I mean, it sounds like the fabric is more um, preferable versus the plastic. So just the question is, is that something that um, could be under consideration for us to have access to? I'm very interested in it. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, so I'll just um, piggyback on that to sort of like further explain if not everyone's super familiar with all of NOVA's activities, but we have a bulk order program, which is an annual program that sells um, organic farming and gardening supplies. And so we um, could potentially include um, the black fabric as like a, as one of the supplies that we could use in the future. So um, I'll be happy to talk to our bulk order coordinator about that. So thank you, Todd. For if I could also add one more thing about the fabric that I find preferable uh, to the plastic. 
although it, it depends on the application. Um, the other good thing about the fabric is that for overhead irrigation, so if we want to do like the Salanova lettuces, the black fabric will allow that water to penetrate and get into the soil, whereas a black plastic would not. It's only going to get into that very narrow part where you made the cut, so we wouldn't be able to use it for our Salanova. For something like your tomatoes or your cucumbers, that may actually not be a great thing because you really want to control the moisture level in your soil, which is where we would, again, I would go away from a single-use plastic and go to the silage tarp. Uh, the added benefit of the silage tarp is also one side is black and one side is white. So when the black side is facing up, it's attracting more heat. So you can superheat your soil in the shoulder seasons. And then in the main season, you can flip it over so the white side is facing up and that's going to reflect the light. So in, if you're growing tomatoes or cucumbers where you're really trying to get more light, the light is going to hit that white uh, plastic, refract back up and hit the plants. So again, Either way, I don't recommend this, the plastic. It's just kind of cheap and accessible, but it's just at the end of the year, anyone who's worked with that stuff, when you pull that stuff up, you're just, oh, what, what is all this? What am I gonna do with all this? And so I've heard growers try to reuse it. It's more of a mess on the second time. So yeah, I highly recommend the fabric. Thank you, that was, that's great. I'm glad we were able to talk about that. Um, so I just wanted to say before I see, there's another question here. So it's about 7.50, and I know that our video was about 25 minutes, so um, Dan has graciously offered that we could go until 8.15 if people still had a lot of questions. Um, so don't feel like you can't ask anything because there's only 10 minutes left if you still had um, a burning question. Uh, but we do have another question here. So um, someone's asked, you mentioned Rimmel Greenhouse, and were they good to work with and did they give you a good price? So uh, one of the main things you may see if you hop online about Rimmel is that they take a while to respond and some people couldn't get a response. And we had that same experience when we were working with them in 2017. But what I will say is since then, there was uh, one of the employees was going through some personal stuff. They divided his uh, area, he was managing too much space. A lot of explanation, but since they made that change, Rimmel has been fantastic to work with. Um, we really love their product. We really love working with them. Bob, the owner, was our first CSA member uh, when we opened up our CSA program. They were just out building that uh, Bobcat as a um, kind of a prototype. They used to sell a normal hoop house, but they changed it to have a gable peak. It works better for shipping. And um, it's really been a dream working with them. Our sales rep, Michael, is fantastic. Anytime we have a question, I can shoot him a text, give him a call. He's really responsive. Uh, and they're right down the, the road from us. They're about, you know, they're on my way to work, so I can stop by and do anything. We can hook up a covered trailer and go over there to pick up our greenhouses. As far as the price, that Bobcat is a little bit more expensive than some of the the other items that it's compared to, like Farmer's Friend has a Caterpillar tunnel that's probably the closest comparison. The Bobcat is a little bit more expensive than that, but the Bobcat is also solid. I mean, that is, if you're concerned about snow load, I would not go with those Farmer's Friend tunnels because they look a little janky to me. The Bobcat is, that thing is a rock, so I'm not concerned about that at all this winter. Uh, and as far as the Nor'easters, I, I can't say that, um, I've done too much work with Griffin or any of the other companies, so I don't know exactly what their prices were, but I believe um, we compared the prices when we first built our tunnels, and I thought I remembered Rimmel being cheaper than those guys, and we're really happy with the product. Uh, one of those growers up in Nova Scotia that we talked to over the winter was just lamenting. He, he, we were all talking at the winter conference with the Rimmel guys, and he was just saying, you guys got to get a... a a shop up in Canada so we can get your tunnels because they don't have access to the I guess where the tunnels are coming from to really great products. So uh, I highly recommend them. They've done a lot of work with UMH, which is how I found out about them in the first place. I think they donated the, the high tunnel to New Horizons. So Bob's a great guy, great people over there, and I'm really happy with their product. I hope they're paying me for this glowing endorsement. Thank you. That's funny. 
Um, so I have another question and then um, we'll see if anyone has any more questions after that. But, you know, of course, we're all living in the time of the pandemic. And so I was wondering how operating a farm that focuses on efficiency aided you in transitioning during the pandemic. So one of the things that we've really prided ourselves on since the beginning is, and this kind of just comes from being the new guys, you know, Dan Legill has no background in farming. He's a restaurateur and he wanted something that could, he could really build as a farm to, a true farm to table operation. Uh, and, you know, I'm relatively new at farming. My background at UNH, uh, I've talked about this a lot with Pete and some of the other students at UNH, that it's a great experience, but it didn't really prepare me for market gardening. Uh, I really had to hit the ground and do a lot of the, the grunt, dirty work myself as I got into the field. What that means is that we've had to be able to change gears on a dime. I mean, whenever we find a new practice that works, we implement it as quick as we can because uh, if we don't, we're going to be dead in the water. And so when the pandemic hit this year, that meant, uh, you know, again, we're a restaurant, direct to restaurant uh, farm of our biggest customers last year. Two of them were restaurants and one of them was the local school district. And so the local school district closed down. One of those restaurants closed down. And one of those restaurants, the Tap House, which is our sister restaurant, was working at a massively reduced capacity. We had another contract with another two big restaurants in Manchester, both closed down. So we were looking at the season and going, oh, no, what are we going to do? Uh, we also had planned the barn on the property was going to be torn down and built back up as a uh, modern event venue and wedding venue and we had all the permits ready for the demo and to get started and we had deposits down on the brand new post and beam structure uh, and all of that was ready to go in march and then the week we were supposed to get started the lockdown order came so all of that got pushed so everything got thrown in the air our whole operation had to change and thank goodness we were able to shift really quickly and that's where the csa came and so i know this question may be a little bit more I'm, I'm taking this a little bit more toward the marketing perspective of it. Uh, but again, we were able to shift toward CSA perspective. Um, we now have a 90 member CSA. It's 56 whole shares, but 90 members total. A lot of people do half shares. Uh, it, it's been a big challenge this year because we, uh, we had a lot of our summer crops already planted by the time we made the shift to CSA. So like our peppers, our, our tomatoes, our cucumbers, uh, those had already been planted beforehand. So we couldn't then go, okay, well, we're just going to plant more of those because we, they had already been planted for six weeks. Uh, so it's been a challenge, but luckily we have a great community in Hooksit that is ready to lift us up. Um, and so that's been huge. You know, as far as the other things around uh, COVID, luckily we don't employ any um, uh, migrant workers. So that hasn't affected our labor flow at all. Um, but we have had to change some of the way we do things. Anytime we're in a, a covered structure, we're all wearing masks. Uh, Pete has been doing some work with us over the summer, uh, graciously, and he can attest to that. Anytime we're in a covered area, everybody's got a mask on. We're all, you know, we're a food service industry, so we're already really concerned with sanitization, making sure everything's really clean, but we've kind of doubled down on that just to make sure. Um, so it's, it's been a challenge, but luckily the one positive is that a lot of people don't want to go to the supermarket. So everybody's been wanting to go to farm stands or go to their farms and get produce that way. And what we're kind of hoping is that then the quality of our product really stands out. And so those people who otherwise wouldn't care about local produce or organic produce, they can taste it and go, oh, that's what local organic produce is. And then they want to come back for that reason. And then that only helps to further that message of local organic. So it, it's been kind of a blessing and a curse. Thank you, that was really helpful. And I know you said that you're hoping to uh, continue the CSA into future years. So that's kind of like a new um, offering that came out of the situation too. So a silver lining. Um, and we do have another question. So here we have, um, this is a two part question. How do you track your efficiency of each crop 
And how do you figure out which props are the most cost effective? So that has, that's a really good question. And that's something that we're still, I'm still trying to get nailed down. Uh, luckily, uh, I've been able to source some really good high grade information in my growing career. So even when I don't have all the answers, I have some people I can turn to that have some of that information. Um, Elliot Coleman's a great one. Uh, Curtis Stone was a great one for kind of profitability and efficiency. Jean Martin is a great one. Uh, and we do try to do as best we can with our record keeping. It is one of the things that year after year I'm always trying to improve. So we now have clipboards that anytime someone goes out in the field and harvests something, they track the harvest. Anytime someone plants something, they put, they're tracking the planting, how much they're planting, the date they're planting it. Um, and then all of that information is stored into the computer. I've got a running Excel spreadsheet that tracks all of that information at the end of the year between December and February, that's when I compile all that data and I figure out which crops sold the best, uh, which crops we spent the most work on. Uh, we're still trying to get that labor hours down. That's kind of the toughest one to, to pinpoint. It's really tough when you're in the heat of the summer, you got a thousand things to do to tell people like, hey, start a stopwatch when you go out there to start harvesting lettuce. Uh, so that one's really hard to nail down. But at the very least, what I've been able to do every year is kind of compile all that data and say, okay, our number one crop was lettuce. And we had 35% of our sales came directly from lettuce. Our number two crop was spinach, our number three crop. And so I can go down the list and see, okay, we did this much sales in these. Um, and then last year, I think the big one that stood out was like summer squashes. Um, we were excited about getting some baby summer squashes and patty pan squashes. And so... Uh, we also did a little bit with like butternut squashes and at the end of the year we had i think i think we had like 600 foot beds of squash and we made like 1200 dollars. and so i'm just looking at it last year we had two-thirds of an acre and i'm going we spent 600 foot beds on summer squash and that's all we made from it and so i i started doing the math i'm thinking okay you know 100 foot bed one cut of Salanova gets between 50 and 100 pounds, 50 pounds at $10 a pound is 500, and then another 250 on the second cut and another 250 on the third cut. So one bed of Salanova makes more than all the six beds of summer squash did all season. And so this year we cut out summer squash. We may bring it back in the future in a more limited capacity, especially as we move toward that CSA model and that retail model. But the, you know, going to restaurants, it just wasn't efficient for us. Um, same thing with broccoli. We've tried broccoli out in the past. And this year, I think I spent like 40, a 40 foot bed in one of our tunnels. We planted as an early broccoli. It was supposed to be an early broccoli. It was like 33 days and it was going to come to harvest. And after 65 days, it still hadn't come to harvest. And then we harvested it and we got five pounds that we could sell for four dollars five dollars a pound and just, okay so this it does not make sense and so we're always just kind of playing with that i think in 10 years if you ask me the same question i'll still say well we don't have it down perfect but we're learning year after year um some of the crops that i can definitely like there is also um i don't want to rattle on too long about this but one of the great uh scales that i learned from curtis stone was called this crop value scale um or crop CRV, crop rating value, something like that. And it's a five point scale uh, that he uses to rate, um, let's see if I can remember these off the top of my head. It's price per pound, um, seasonality, yield per square foot, um, demand, and days to maturity. And so all of those can be rated between one and five and that gives you an overall value of one to five. And so I know off the top of my head, like lettuce, that's a five out of five crop. Because again, seasonality, we can grow it all year long. Maybe it slows down a little bit in the winter. Uh, the price per pound is huge. The yield per square foot is huge. The days to maturity is not too bad. And the demand is through the roof. Um, same with radishes, same with spinach. Tomatoes are actually like a three or a four. We make a lot of money off of tomatoes, but the seasonality is really low and the days to maturity is really high. Uh, and so we use that to, to rate all of our crops. And so if you throw a crop at me, I can give you a rough estimate of what I think that crop is off the top of my head. And we're always evaluating that as the year goes on. And then I have one little thing that I kind of added to that myself. 
it's less important than all those other ones I found. Unfortunately, I wish it was a little bit higher, but I call it just the wow factor. And that's just anytime you get a crop that when people see it, they just flip out over it. Like the husk cherries are just a wow factor. A lot of people don't know what it is, but when they taste them, they're just like, oh man, these are great. And so we have a lot of dedicated followers now just because they tried the husk cherries and they're really excited about them. Um, sometimes that doesn't work out like with um, purple carrots, you know, they, they look great and sometimes people love them at the market, but restaurants are like, yeah, I don't care about purple carrots. They, you know, when you cook them, the purple goes away anyway, so just bring me a normal carrot. So it, it, it's kind of a hit or miss with that. Cool, thank you. And um, so Laura, our office assistant, uh, kindly put a link in the chat to the cost of production project, which is a project that NOFA New Hampshire was involved with, with some of our fellow NOFA chapters, Vermont and Massachusetts, a few years ago. And it evaluated some specialty crops and the cost of production to grow them organically. And so there's some fact sheets on that webpage about carrots, lettuce, onions, winter squash, potatoes, uh, whole farm financials, and crop profitability, and tips for tracking cost of production. So people can go to that link and you can find that on our website too under the programs tab. Um, so that's really helpful. And then we have another two part question. Um, I know it's a little after eight, but we said we can go to 815. So thanks again, everyone. I think this was a really great conversation. So we have, where do you purchase your bulk seed for your spring slash summer crops and fall slash winter crops? And then the second question is, are there specific varieties um, that you found grow better than others? So the first part of that is we get most of our seeds through Johnny's. Uh, Johnny's, is, uh, most people know they're based out of Maine. They've just been great working with us. Um, they're really low hassle. They, they also do some breeding. So it's always great when you get that new variety and it's just got something those other, I mean, Salanova is the, the real one I can point to that just totally changed the way we grow. Um, and so we, we try to get as much stuff as we can through them just because it's easy to have one supplier and um, it, we like doing business with them. Uh, we found like we, we started ordering a ton of pea tendril seeds because every week we're planting like eight flats of pea tendrils. Uh, and we found another person that had pea tendril seeds for cheaper organic pea tendril seeds and we contacted them and we said, hey, can you match our price? I said, yeah, no problem. So um, it's been really great working with them. When we can't get something uh, through Johnny's or we can't get it organically, we'll go through High Mall Organics. They're also a really nice company. I believe they're based out of Ohio. Uh, but their selection isn't quite as wide as Johnny's. Um, so, and I don't think they have as many organic pelletized seeds either. They have some, but like, especially with lettuce, when you're planting into flats, it's just huge to have pelletized seeds. Uh, it saves so much time and effort. Uh, and I believe that's like an organic clay. So it's not like they're, you know, pelletizing them with all kinds of uh, fungicides or anything like that. Um, and the second part of that question, uh, can, can we pull that up? Yeah, I can uh, repeat it. Um, are there specific varieties that you found grow better than others? Yes, absolutely. Um, obviously, the one that I just can't shut up about is the Salanova. But with radish, uh, for example, we had a lot of problems with radish because we wanted to grow all these funky different types of radish, like the red meats and the French breakfast. And uh, we tried this black radish called Nero Tondo that has a really thick black skin and a white interior. And we just found that it was like, so hard to grow them that if you didn't get the timing perfect, then they would be super hot. And if you didn't, uh, or they'd be pithy, they'd get really like uh, spongy on the inside and hollow. Uh, and we tried this variety called Rover that just, as soon as we plant, or as soon as we got the first harvest, we were just blown away. It's a normal like red looking radish with a white interior, uh, but the flavor is mild and really, really sweet. And it's just, again, like with the Salanova, it's, it, with a lot of those radishes, you need to get it the day it's ready. We've got a one to three day window. And if you don't get it then, it's gone. And with the Rovers, we had like two weeks on either side in the middle of the summer. And so that was kind of a, a, real, um, a real game changer for us. And now we can grow radish. Um, and so all of our 
varieties, we kind of have uh, all of our crops. We have varieties that we've used. Some of them we like, and some of them we're still constantly evolving. Like with our tomatoes, uh, we still can't nail down the varieties of tomatoes that we really love. Every year, we're always switching things up, and our favorites are always changing. Uh, as the market changes, we change what we need as well. And so, hopefully, someday we'll get that like that perfect combination nailed down. But until then, we're still kind of shuffling and trying to figure things out. Um, and again, I think some of that information comes from uh, working with some of those, uh, uh, working with other farmers and just asking them what works well for them, looking at some of those other growers and some of their information and a lot of trial and error, a lot of just, hey, that worked well, this one didn't, moving on. Great, thank you. So does anyone have any other questions that you want to type into the chat? I'll wait like a couple of minutes and or a couple of moments rather, not a couple of minutes, but um, and if there are none, I just wanted to put up one more slide and, and we can say goodnight. That's mean. I think everyone's tired of listening to me by now. <laughs> 815, I mean, everyone wants to turn on the TV and have some tea and go to bed. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Dan, pull, Dan, Dan oh, for what it's worth, this has been very helpful for me. I'm a backyard gardener, uh, and I got a lot of uh, great pointers and appreciate this presentation. Thank you. Oh, I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you, man. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to just put up this one last um, screen here. Um, someone else also says you've been awesome. Thank you. I agree, too. Um, Thank you for sharing your time and infinite knowledge. So I'm just going to put up this one slide so that we can all see the next um, tours that we have coming up. I hope everyone can see that. So thank you again, everyone. And this concludes our tour and discussion with Hippie's Farm. And Dan, thank you again so much for showing us around the farm and for answering all our questions tonight. I thought this was a really great conversation. and. Um, if you did like this tour and you'd like to support Milka, New Hampshire, you can do so by becoming a member or making a donation. And there are links right there on the screen that you can see. And please also mark your calendars for our next virtual craft tour, which is going to be with Mermaid Hill Vineyard on Wednesday, August 26th at 7 p.m. Well, thanks again for spending your evening with us and hope you have a great night.